Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Looks like there's room for everyone. Seats up here, there. Yep, I know. This is our combined service. Hopefully, it didn't scare too many people away, but good morning and welcome. Uh, a few quick announcements. If you are a jam kiddo or if you want to take your kids to the preschool, toddler, nursery class, um, teachers are all in their classes, and we are starting jam at the beginning of service, and that was just intended to free up some seats, which looks like it has worked, so there's room for all the adults, so Jam Kids can head in there. Um, a few quick announcements. We encourage everyone to stay after the service today. That was the purpose of our joint service, because right after service, any of you that do need to hustle out, we'll give a few minutes as, as people trickle out. We're going to bring out some lunch for a, just a light lunch that we will serve, and then we will hop right into our open forum meeting with the purpose of discussing uh, where we're at in the building project of our new church facility and uh, what it looks like moving forward. There are several options, and the elders and building team would like your feedback on that. So that's right after service today. Please stick around for that. Uh, kids, we will have in the um, chapel, we will have childcare in there. If your kids want to run around and have lunch, that will happen in there. If you take a look at the flyer in your bulletin, you will see that two weeks from now, um, our missionaries from uh, Papua New Guinea are going to be here. The Weatheralls, Aaron and Erica, will be here during that service. That's two Sundays from now. Um, so it's a great time to hear what they're doing over there. So we encourage you to be here. And on that same evening, two Sundays from now, we have a gospel concert. Um, some of you may have know, may know the uh, McCormicks. There's a few of them in that picture there, Father and a couple of their his sons and some others, um, they are going to be here for a concert that evening right here. So um, I've heard great things about their group, and I've heard uh, Mike and his boys sing before, and they are phenomenal. So I'm guessing when you put them all together, it's going to be pretty amazing. And finally, this Wednesday is our day of fasting and prayer. We take the first Wednesday of each month as a day to um, focus on prayer and fasting. We will have a 6 p.m. very brief service um, here, time to come together. We'll share communion, pray together. Um, it's, it's very brief. That'll happen here at 6 p.m., but we encourage anyone, whether you can be here that evening or not, to spend that day. Um, we're encouraging people to focus on praying for the persecuted church. That's this Wednesday. And I was wrong. This is the last announcement. Christmas Play auditions and part signups are this Saturday, November 4th, 10 a.m. here at the church. So if you're interested in being a part of the Christmas program, young and old, join us on uh, this Saturday here at the church, 10 a.m. All right. Well, let's go ahead and pray as we get started in worship. Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning that we can come together. I thank you for each one of my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here this morning to fellowship to spend time in prayer in your word and worshiping. Father, I pray your spirit would fill this place and that we would um, turn our attention, our focus, and our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, would you guys please stand with me as we get started in worship here?
That's great. Um, okay, so we are going to pray together. So you remain standing for just a moment, but I'd like to first invite Rick and Christy Dunning up here, if you would please come. I didn't ask permission for this, but uh, um, Rick and Christy have been a part of our church family for a couple years now, right? Come on up. And um, part of our growth group ministry, and tomorrow is a very, very big day for Christy. She is having brain surgery for, for Parkinson's, and um, we know that's a huge thing for both of you, and I'd just like to lift you up in prayer. Anything very specific you would ask for? Dr. Birchall. Dr. Birchall. Okay. We'll pray for Dr. Birchall. All right. Let's pray. Father, as your, your family here in Yakult, at this little church, we just lift up Rick and Christy in this time. This is um, a very significant moment in their lives, and especially Christie's. We pray for a peace that surpasses all understanding that will guard our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus. Lord, we know that as we sing those songs and we hear some hooping and hollering back there, that's Christy. As she, um, she loves you and loves worship, and Lord, I just pray that this could be, uh, however you could orchestrate it, a worshipful time for her. We pray for Dr. Bergstrom? Birchall. Birchall. We pray for Dr. Birchall. Father, we thank you for the doctors that you put in our lives. We pray for extra good sleep for him tonight and um, steady hands tomorrow. Give him great grace. Also, Father, we just pray for success. We pray for your will, your success in this, and that the exploratory side of this or the, the experiential, experimental side of this would prove to be of great value um, for Christy and her mobility and um, her part of your kingdom here continued on from tomorrow. Pray for Rick, give him um, peace as his wife is amongst um, those in the waiting room just waiting. So be with him, reside over him. And keep her in our hearts and our minds, especially the next 24 hours. We love you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. All right. Yes. You're welcome. You're back. You're back. Okay. Um, I'll invite you to be seated. Thank you so much for praying. We, we also are just going to pray for our time of offering as the ushers come forward in, um, in just a moment. And, and we have a few other families to pray for this morning. So join me in another prayer. That's what we do. Father, we just thank you for the, the gift we have to come to you boldly and ask for, ask for healing hands in our families' lives. We pray specifically for our families of the week, Daryl and Shirley Coffey, as well as Dwayne and Debbie Christensen. We pray, Lord, for them. We pray for their heart and love for you to strengthen and grow their heart and love for one another to grow deep and intimate, and give them wisdom as they love grandkids, as they love their kids, um, as they go about their work. Pray for their continued health as well. Father, we also lift up this offer, offering to you, and we recognize that all that we have is a gift from you, and we give as an act of worship, not as an act of compulsion or guilt or prodding. Um, and we love you, and pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
so much, worship team, Noah, team, it's awesome. And um, we're going to be in the book of Acts, chapter 7. You can turn your Bibles there. As you're doing that, we have a little bit of a recap video on some of the stuff that's been going on at the property, mainly the roof. This is just one video from last week, and it was our lowest attendance on that week, so it's not representative of all of you who have been helping out through the last four or five weeks, six weeks, specifically on the roofing portion, but it gives you just a little snippet, and I also say it as um, an encouragement. One more week, and we'll have the roof completely finished, and so we'll need as many helpers, whether you can get up on the roof or whether you need to help on the ground, there's plenty of work to do on both spots. So um, with that, let's go ahead and show this video. So, so awesome. That was the first time I'd seen it too. So it's always fun to, to get a picture of that. Thank you so much. Is Shannon in here with Shannon Wilson and Blake Guptill. Are you guys in here somewhere? There's Shannon. I know Blake is somewhere. And then Noah, our worship leader who for editing it, but they took all the shots and that's cool. It's going to be really cool in 20, 30 years um, as the church body is looking to continue the mission of sharing the gospel here and around the world and just to see the process. It's just a building, and we don't want to get too consumed with the building, but it is a building that we've made the choice to do mostly all of ourselves, and so um, it's fun to have that captured. <sighs> okay, well, Acts chapter 7. So I'm going to pray in just a minute, but you just need to know this is um, the longest sermon in the book of Acts. It's actually, we're covering 53 or so, the 60 or so verses. And that's a lot. And we're not going to do the same normal approach this morning. I wish we could, but we can't due to time. And so we will, we will get it all in, but it'll, it'll be moving along. So we will ask now for the Lord's blessing on the time. Father, we again, as we come and worship and sing and interact and pray for one another, now we come to a holy time, a time where we open your word and we profess, Father, that it is our light. It is the light unto our feet. 
in a dark place, in a dark world, especially today with so many things going on globally, especially in the Middle East. Lord, there is so much tension. And Lord, you're above all of those things. And we look to you and to your direction and your sovereignty there and in our own lives here. Give us your spirit, fill us this morning, and may your word transform us more and more into the image of your son by the power of your spirit. And we pray this in Christ, amen. The challenge last week, we met someone last week and he's a critical player in our Christian story. That's the man, Stephen. And the reason why Stephen is so important in the Christian um, narrative up until this point is because he very much is like you and I. He most likely, according to the, the smart people, the scholars, the commentators, was a convert um, to the Christian faith. He was a Greek, a Gentile, as some would say, but he had, in his life, become a Jew. And he was a faithful Jew, a Jew who knew the Bible, the Old Testament, and followed its ways. But after Pentecost, we could see that the church, as it began very small, started to share the message of Christ and faith in him to a Jewish people. And Stephen was one that heard the message of the gospel as a Jew and converted to Christian faith. And he then was, because we know he's probably, he was a young man, most likely, but he had a lot of wisdom, he had great character, and um, he, was, he was of good repute. And so he was, he was elected by the church to be one of the seven deacons to help take care of the needs in the church. One of the needs that came up very quickly was to be um, a apologia, apologetic for the faith that was coming under quick attack because the church is growing so radically, so quickly in such a minute time frame, just a few months, going from hundreds to thousands, multiple thousands, that the power that the religious elites, of which we'll look at today, in this case, the Sanhedrins, which were Hellenistic or Grecian Jews that had this power um, in their lap, well, they're seeing their power diminish because people are falling in love with Jesus and they don't like it. So they arrest Stephen. And last week we looked at all the ways that they lied and brought false accusations against Stephen. And then that picks up where we are at today with Stephen. Before we look at that specifically, I would like you just to put your mind in the framework of Jews of that day. And, and I'll just say this, I love the Bible. And one of the reasons why I love it so much is the way that God brings it into our lives at just the right moment in, in our culture, in our daily struggles. And, and when, when I sit down and lay out a preaching series, and a text that today, one, it, it is a text that leads us into next week, which is our day of prayer for the persecuted church. So it's very appropriate in that sense. But Many months ago, there's no way I could have known, obviously, that the world would be in the place that it's in today with the Middle East and the war between Israel and Hamas. And, and that is an issue that is wickedly hot if you have opened your eyes, even in a little bit. And there is strong positions and it reminds me kind of going back to things like COVID or to vaccines or to masks, but on a much bigger scale, at least spiritually speaking, where there really isn't one simple right answer. People want to say, you're either this or you're this. Well, this particular issue does not, from a cultural perspective, have an easy answer. And yet, that is what is so contentious. And this text today is not directed specifically at, um, I just, you need to know, I'm not making any statements. I'm coming to a text today that was planned out almost a year ago. <laughs> and I just think, man, Lord, you're so great. So let God's word be our guide here because culture has all kinds of different ways to address the present issues that we're dealing with. 
And if there's anything that we as a church body, as followers of Jesus here in North County need to be secure on is that we don't take our wisdom, our counsel, our values from the hot emotions that are in our culture, whether it's over an issue like this or something else, we need to go to the Lord and see his perspective and rest in his sovereignty. So take that in consideration because as we look at this, there's gonna be things regardless of a position that someone might take in this room and certainly in our world that isn't gonna please either one of those issues. And I think that's why I love God's word because it's not man's word, it's God's word. So that being said, that being said, I, that was more than I wanted to say. That being said, uh, the, there are some privileges that the, the Jewish people, the Israelites had and had been given by God. What are those things? I put them in your notes because they're just good to re- be reminded of. Number one is they had land. They had land. The Israelites received the promised land from the Lord. It's funny when you listen to the debate today, you, you, hear, you hear commentators on the news that will talk about the history of this conflict going back 50, 60, or maybe 70 plus years. It's so narrow-minded, narrow-sighted when you look at the scope of God's redemptive plan. That's just a tiny blip in thousands of years of history. And so that's just one thing. But the land was was promised to them from the Lord. The other privilege that the Israelite people had was that they had strong God-directed leadership to look to. Moses, David, Solomon, so many other leaders, not all perfect leaders, we know none of them were perfect leaders, but they had this leadership that was appointed and put in place by God. They also had, and I just wanted to stick with L's, so I put location here. That's not to reflect the land. It's actually to talk about they had a place with focused worship. They had the temple that was built. They worshiped in this particular location. That was a privilege that they had. And they saw it as a great privilege because even before that, they had a location, the tabernacle, that would move with them. But there was always this one location in which they had to worship. Another privilege that they had was they had the Lord. They had a special, anointed by God, covenantal relationship with him. They had the Lord. And the last one that they had, the five privileges, they had the law. They had the Torah. They had the Old Testament Bible, the law of Moses. They had these privileges, these five, there's probably more. But these are five privileges that they had. And the reason that's important is because here in Acts chapter 7, Stephen does a gloriously beautiful job of retelling the history of the Jewish people, of God's people, starting with Abraham all the way up to the present day then. And he quotes extensively from the Bible in which they all, the Torah, in which they all were looking to. And a subtle point, it's not in your notes, but it's just interesting that every point that Stephen makes in these 53 plus verses, 56 verses plus, um, are directly from the Bible. His message here, the longest message in Acts, is a biblical message. That's important. That's why we walk through the Bible and why I, I, still I hear, well, why don't you do teachings on the end times or do teachings on um, this particular issue of marriage? Um, well, first off, I think that the Bible does. I think this message today, because it's not my words, it's the Holy Spirit's words, it will apply to whatever particular bent or situation that you're facing. It applies in all things because that's what God does. It's a living and active word. It, it just, it applies. Um, but the other side of it is there's a place for maybe some focused teaching. And we do that from time to time. We're actually gonna break in this series and we're going to do more of a topical message on, a world, on world view and a, a biblical Christian worldview. But the majority of our diet is we look at the word of God. And that's what they were doing here May that always be what we look to as we look at the contentious issues in our world. Stephen, we know, did this. He most likely memorized, because he was a good Jew, he knew the Old Testament. 
And even in a very stressful situation, he was able to give an account for the hope that he had within him. And that account is what we see in this chapter. So we're going to lean in here and look. Verse 1 of of chapter 7 says, I know you guys turned there. Verse 1 says, And the high priest said, Are these things so? And those things he's speaking about are the accusations that came towards towards Stephen. And um, he said, are these things so, they asked Stephen. Now, he ultimately is saying here, the Sanhedrin, they're saying, the high priest, he's saying, how do you plead, Stephen? How do you plead? Literally, Stephen, here you have a chance to defend yourself. So you get to defend yourself, settle up, um, clarify for us. But they... They have a trap set, he, and Stephen knows this. They, they know that if he says yes to these things, then he's obviously guilty, right? And if he says no, then they'll obviously accuse him of, of lying. But again, as a spirit-filled follower of Christ, especially as accusations falsely come towards a Christian, um, it's important to know what Stephen does. He doesn't take this chance to defend himself. That's not what he's interested. He's not interested in defending himself. That's not what he's about. He instead explains to them from the scripture in such ways as that will cause them to become, as you'll see, quite unhinged here shortly. So then we have verse two. It says, um, he says, brothers and fathers, hear me. Brothers and fathers. So this is a sign of, this is a good thing. It's a way to respect. We saw this this week, didn't we? With Those of you who saw the, the speaker of the house who just took over a very difficult situation and as he speaks up front, you talk about pulling people together. He's trying to draw respect, um, to have a listening ear from the whole. And we know that's part of the process. We know that's a very contentious place. And he knows he's walking into that. So he's making the attempt to say, hey, whether we have differences on issues, are we not in a very important place as leaders of this government? We're going to need to figure out how to work together. Again, I don't want to get into that too much, but this is kind of what Stephen is doing here when he says brothers, because brothers points to those in his, that are maybe watching from the outside, but when he says fathers, that's a sign of respect. And then he says, hear me, listen to me, give attention to me. That word that he's using there is the same word um, in Hebrew called shema, which shema is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is... The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and with all of your might. So he, he's doing this, he's kind of getting the stage set. He's not defending himself, but he's, he's kind of trying to garner some level of um, connection and similarities that they have together. And then he moves here, and he starts to break down the rest here, especially up through um, ver- verse 43, but he, he breaks down the, the, the text in such a way, the Old Testament text, that it lays this groundwork for what is going to be done. So if you're taking notes, um, the, the first part of his, what we'll say is his exposition, the first part of his sermon explaining the Old Testament to these very religious elites, um, he's saying that God's not limited to one land, but works in every land. God's not limited to one land, but he works in every land. Look at verse, this is kind of found in verses two through eight. Verse two says, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. The God of glory, this is a title again of of reverence, pointing to God's glory and his beautiful sovereign attributes. Um, Now, what's interesting, when he points to Abraham, whom they all respect and look to, He's pointing out that Abraham here is a, is a worshiper of pagan gods in a pagan land. Because in verse 6 it tells us, and you can look there, it says, the offspring of Abraham were sorcerers in a land belonging to others. Verse 2 again, it says that he was in Mesopotamia, that is our modern day Iraq, moving up in the area of Iraq to Haran. And so he was not part of the promised land originally. He wasn't part of anything but a pagan culture, worshiping idols. But what did God do? He called him. He called him out, blessed him, 
and promised him some very important things which apply today. Um, the key here is that God is not limited to one land, but he's at work in every land. And Stephen is drawing that out in verses 8 through 10. It says in Hebrews 11:10, it says that Abraham, he was living in tents. Again, just pointing to the fact that what they have experienced today, which these privileges of being able to worship in this place called Jerusalem, worship in the temple, um, didn't begin there. God's not bound to their ideas. And, and sadly, what all of these Sanhedrin and many, many, many of the Jews had done at that day is what a lot of um, religious people do today, maybe even some Christian people, where they, they take the privileges that they had, in this case, the Jews, they had these wonderful privileges of being blessed by God, um, having this great leadership, having a place to worship, having a special covenant relationship with God, and they soiled it because their heart was hard to God and they clammed onto and grabbed onto the traditions around their faith and lost sight of the heart of what God wanted was, was to, well, going back to the Garden of Eden to dwell in shalom relationship with his people. And so you have this picture here. He's saying, hey, verses one through eight, this, this is not about this land so much because God revealed himself outside of this land. Secondly, um, it says here that um, the Israelites have always rejected God's appointed leaders. The Israelites have always rejected God's appointed leaders. And this is obviously the bulk of this sermon. Again, we're not going to be able to get into every ins and outs of this, but um, it's an important point. Um, God's people in the history of history, they have been given by God's grace leaders, patriarchs, and time and time and time and time and time and time again, God is faithful and the people are unfaithful. And we see this covered in these verses of his sermon. So, for example, the, the brothers of Joseph who became the patriarchs, they rejected their sibling Joseph. They did this out of jealousy, selling, them into, selling him into Egypt. And Stephen says, hey, you take pride in these patriarchs, but guess what? The patriarchs you're talking about are the same ones that ambushed Joseph and sold him into slavery. But as we know, we look at Genesis chapter 52, we know that what God meant for evil... <laughs> I'm glad you're paying attention. What man meant for evil, God meant for good. God takes evil and he turns it into something that will shine his glory. And we saw that with what happened with Joseph as he became a man that was second in command of all of the land. And yet in the midst of that, he was able to save the people of Israel from dying from a famine. And because of that, they increased, according to verse 17 here, they increased and they multiplied in, in Egypt. So then he explains here how Moses was born in verse 22, and he says that he was instructed by all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and his deeds. And I just kind of find it fascinating, don't you, how, how much space Stephen gives in this little sermon, big sermon, to Moses. Um, and maybe that's because in response to the charges that he had faced earlier in the later parts of chapter 6, he was charged with um, blaspheming God and speaking out against Moses. So he's basically saying, really? I don't think you know Moses as, think you, as well as you think you know Moses, or the story as well as you think you do. So he, he kind of divides this up, and, and Stephen here in his summary divides the life of Moses, and this is pretty cool because I think it applies. Not that we will live as long as Moses, but the, the idea is there. Um, he, he divides Moses up into three 40-year segments, and um, D.L. Moody said this. He says, Moses spent 40 years thinking the first 40 years thinking he was somebody. Then he spent the second group of 40 years learning he was nobody. And then in the last 40 years, he discovering what God can do with a nobody. I think it's pretty good. Yeah. After recounting these experiences with Moses at the burning bush, um, Stephen points out how God sent Moses as a deliverer 
deliverer in verse 34 and 35. And then we see how these people responded. Moses is a gift from God, a leader from God that's been sent. And look at all that he has done. And then in verses 34 and 35, they reject him. They say, this Moses whom they rejected saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? And then in verse 37, and this is key here. Jesus links Moses with the promise of the coming Messiah, Jesus. It says that God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is a direct quote, again from Moses, and quoted by Stephen in, from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, where Moses then adds, it is to him you shall listen. It's pointing to Christ. So Stephen is ultimately reminding them that Moses is not the final one because he pointed to a prophet that was to come in the future. And guess who that prophet is? It's Christ. Jesus himself in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 45 through 47, says, There's one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, he, how will you believe in my words? You see how... If you didn't believe in Moses and what he was saying, then they're not going to believe in Christ. And that's exactly what has happened. And so Stephen is basically saying something like this. If you say you follow Moses, then believe what Moses said about Jesus and follow Jesus, follow him. But God's people, as we see, constantly rejected. In verse 39, Stephen shows how God's people turn their backs on God's prophets. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt. They thrust him aside, casting him away, because the forefathers, basically the grandpas or the great grandpas or the more than that grandpas and grandmas, they were fickle and they didn't follow Moses as scripture called them to. And on top of that, they turned an idol, verse 41, look at verse 41, and they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idols and were rejoicing in the work of their hands. So the thing about like this, and this is when Moses comes down, he's, he's got the, the, the commandments, the, the law, and the moment he comes down, they're already disobeying the first two commandments of not loving the Lord their God and, and creating um, and worshiping idols, which is what they worship. And what people worship today, they basically worship the work of their own hands, amongst other things. So we see this. This is a, a, a recurring theme in the book here that Stephen's message is saying, God provides and you reject. And then thirdly, we see that he's saying that God is to be worshipped everywhere. God is to be worshipped everywhere. Verses 44 and 45. See, these Jewish, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, they were locked into worshiping in the temple only. And Stephen reminds them that this was not always the case, that God was worshiped outside of Jerusalem when they were in a tabernacle and they wandered in the wilderness. Solomon later had this privilege of constructing the temple, which again was a privilege, but then they turned that temple into um, a, an empty, heartless religion. So in verses 49 and verses 50, it's interesting here, Stephen quotes Isaiah 66. One and two, it says this, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all of these things? The whole universe is God's dwelling place. He is sovereign, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, he's the most high, and God cannot be contained to a building, to a box. Again, they took a place that was meant for beauty and converted it into a place of emptiness, of heart. So, so at this point, he kind of just, this is where it takes a fun turn, and, and next week, um, We'll see this a little bit more clearly. Um, But he takes this kind of exposition of the text, explaining what their Old Testament Bibles were saying and how they were involved or not involved in this process. And then he points it to personal application towards them. Um, And he says, basically, verse 51, you stiffed 
stiff-necked people. Uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. You've, you, you've always touted this special relationship with God, but guess what? It is empty. You are a stiff-necked people. You've lost sight of any love of God and God's love for you. And then this next one is great because we're in our culture today, this would mean a whole lot to us, but when he says you... Un, the, uncircumcised in heart and ears, that's, that would be some serious fighting words. I'm sure if those Sanhedrin were concealed carrying at that moment, they would probably be reaching for it. Because there's not much of a bigger, um, a bigger insult that you could give in that case, because these people took great pride in that they were different from all those Gentiles or that un, those unholy people because they were of the circumcised people. And they took great pride in this. And it helped them to stand out and above from everybody else. But then he says, circumcised or not, your hearts are uncircumcised, as are your ears. And that would have been a very pointed very pointed comment. And then he says, and you always resist the Holy Spirit as, and then he insults their fathers by speaking the truth, as your fathers did, so do you. You're a stiff-necked people. Uh, Moses records similar words in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verse three. He says, I will not go up among you lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And there's really two ways to deal with stiff-necked stick, stick, stick folk. And I know this from experience personally. There's two ways that God deals with that. One is that we bend our wills to him or God breaks our wills before him. And that's an important point to make. We either bend our wills to God and we've talked about that already in this series. What does that look like? Well, that's, that's being filled with the Holy Spirit. First off, it means trusting Christ by faith um, and placing your faith in Christ. But following up is like living our lives full of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to bend our wills to his day in and day out. Um, or God will break our wills before him. Charles Spurgeon said it like this. Whenever God means to make a great man... He always breaks him in pieces first. I would say that's me, but then it would also be me saying, well, I'm a great man. I'm not saying I'm a great man, but I've walked in those ways, if you know my story, of being broken into pieces. Um, verse 52, we already talked about the uncircumcised of hearts outwardly. They conform to the requirements of the law, and maybe many of us do too. Outwardly, we say the right things, believe the right things, but inwardly, our hearts are much more like the heathens, the lost of this day. We've just settled for a religious process rather than a heartfelt reality. So he delivers this huge blow, and he says, you always resist the spirit. Always, he says, as your fathers did. And uh, he has some more stuff to say. In verse 52, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They were following their father's footsteps when they persecuted Christ. And now they're following their father's footsteps by persecuting guys like Stephen and the Christians there. So the last part, he kind of goes for the jugular here, verse 52. And they killed those who announced the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. The fathers killed the prophets who announced the coming of Christ and they murdered the Messiah when he came. Isaiah 53, 11 says, by this knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. He's pointing to Christ here. This sermon by Stephen is, is um, just a picture of what it means to be a follower of Christ full of the spirit. Someone who knows the word and um, is not willing to be um, pushed aside or not stand up courageously. What do we do with this? Well, there's a few things, I think, just quick application points that you have in your, in your notes there if you're taking them. And if you're in a growth group, um, you'll, take, you'll take these as kind of your questions this week and you leaders can adjust them however you want. 
Um, number one is um, read and heed the Old Testament scriptures. I think the New Testament is good too, but there's especially a push today by some evangelicals that say the Old Testament isn't um, very practical for Christians today, and I would just say that's heresy. So Corinthians 10.6, it says, Now these things took place as an example for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Heed and read our Old Testament. And we saw the detriment of that in the Sanhedrin. Secondly, live for the glory of God. Live for the glory of God. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, So whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Let the glory of God be your life motto. I live for the glory of God alone. Next. Next up is give your life to Jesus now. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ now. Um, There is a real heaven. There is a real Jesus. There's only one way there despite, again, the, the screaming of the Oprahs of the world or the social media influencers. There's not many ways to God. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So many churches today um, are people sitting there that buy into this idea that, no, there's really a lot of ways to heaven. Well, that's the case, then Jesus is a liar, and that, if, that, if that's what you believe, then you shouldn't call yourself a follower of Christ. Fourthly, this one's an easy one. Um, forgive those that have wronged you. Forgive those who have wronged you. If Stephen could forgive while stones were slashing his body apart and bludgeoning him to death, and he could forgive them, which we'll see next week, we can forgive. Ephesians 4, 32 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Forgive. Fifthly, live like you are dying. Live like you're dying because you are. Every one of us is. That's the reality of this life, and we don't know. Some of you know, I lost my aunt to a quad accident here a few weeks ago. I saw her six weeks earlier. These things happen. Um, live like you're dying because you are. Live boldly for the Lord Jesus. Live each day as if it was your last day. And when it is your time, picture Christ Jesus standing there to welcome you. Book of Psalms, Psalm 90, verse 12 says, Teach us, O Lord, to number our days that we might get a heart of wisdom. And I need a heart of wisdom. It seems like numbering our days is a big part of that. And then I'll just add here again, um, just again, the, this tension that we find ourselves in today between these polarizing issues. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, you, you'll have to take stands on things for sure, but let the scriptures be your guide. Um, look to the Lord for his direction more than you look to talking points of those that are very well spoken on whatever side of any issue is being discussed. Because people seem to get immediately ostracized if they say one thing or another. The reality is that our God gave his son because he loved the entire world. The entire world. But this world, as we know, um, has been taken outside of because of the fall of humankind, because of our choice to sin. Um, There is an evil that is present. And that evil is real. We get to see that evil now. Um, But even the evil... And a misappropriate, this is where, again, I want to just be very careful. God loves the world. God loves the world. And yes, um, steps are going to need to be made 
Um, some steps must be made, some steps maybe should not be made. Real people, despite a label that they give themselves or another nation gives them or culture gives them, those are people that are loved by God that need Jesus. And many of them do on both sides of a wall. So let, let God direct you um, and be careful with getting sucked into the, the vitriol hate that spews in both directions. That's all I'll say. I, that's all I'll say, but we're not called to be people of this culture. We have confessed to be followers of Christ and how would Christ engage? We know that there are end times elements to some of these things. And if we knew exactly what those were, and we'll be ferreting some of those things out here in the future, but we still are called to be people that know what we know and that's, that God does love the world and our primary mission is to have God's heart towards those so that they could become saved. And we know that God has dealt harshly with people in the past. We see a lot of it in the Old Testament. Um, but we live also under a new covenant that, ca- that calls us to balance grace and truth. And um, it's, there's not a lot of that today, this balance between grace and truth, because we're quick to, to push people into a category. And so just be on guard, that's all. Just walk in the spirit. Don't fall into the clumsy games of our culture um, and, and allow God to do God's work. Okay, I'm gonna get a lot of emails this week just for saying that. Um, but uh, let's pray together. Father, we trust your sovereignty completely. And we know, Father, there's been a lot going on in the Middle East in the last 50 to 70 years. Um, Father, we also know that that is a small um, bit on a, a plan that goes back thousands of years. Father, we know that your hand is, is um, perfect and righteous. And Father, we know that you love. Draw us into your love. Um, Help us to see this world the way you would see it. Help us to stand strongly where we need to stand strongly, but not put the scheming of Satan himself and the demonic forces in this world, um, don't let it divorce us from um, the ability to know that there's lost souls that are captured by him. Deal with these things righteously. Father, we pray for the hurting and the lost um, in this conflict. And we pray, Lord, that you would provide the needs for the the innocent people um, and you would provide provide for the, um, the safety of all people as things are taking place. And Lord, I pray for godly restraint I pray for people um, that are privileged by you to first and foremost look to your leading and your guidance and to, Lord, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for those who don't and make decisions righteously based on that. And I pray that also for a world that has surrounded the nation Israel that is incredibly hostile and being used of our enemy. Uh, We just pray for their hearts. Lord, we know that vengeance is yours and we trust that and yet we as followers of your son ask that we would see this issue like your son sees people. He he doesn't see them based upon their status or based upon their nationality, based upon their titles. He sees them as dearly loved people and may we see all people that way as well as we labor with all the Holy Spirit's energy proclaim Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. Again, as we stand here, we have a final song. If you would like prayer, we have prayer up front. And just a reminder too, after the service, even if you're not regular here, if this is your first Sunday, you're more than welcome. If you're a member, we ask that you stay. Um, um, Or if you just want to know a little bit about our church, this is a great time for you to know a little bit about our church body and how we operate because we're talking about pretty heavy, fun, big, God, faith, obstacles. 
and um, there'll be some food, there's childcare provided, but with that, um, if you can't, that's fine. Feel free to jump on the shuttle if you parked out there, um, but we'll, as soon as the service ends, grab grub, bring it in here, and get rocking and rolling. So let's, let's, um, let's sing this final song together.
is our living hope. Uh, all right, uh, before the benediction, parents, please, um, for those of you who have kids in nursery and preschool, you can go grab them and help them with their food if you're able to stick around rather than, yeah, all those kids going after the food table by themselves. Um, and uh, with that, thank you. I love you, church family. Let's um, receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance before you and give you peace. You're dismissed. And all God's people said, amen. Ready? Are you ready? So I didn't get back to you about.